1975, makeup of a club in terms of cars was exclusively side screens. Wind up window TRs were still associate members, and TR7s had only been seen in car magazines so far. The club at that time, 35% were TR2s, 15% were TR3s, and 50% were TR3As. This was to change radically, and by 1980, the attendance at the 10th anniversary here at Hot Cross Holt was dominated by TR6s, just 10 years later. The late Alan Robinson did the first census on car ownership, but very soon there was a need to keep more detailed records on ownerships of each model of car. Initially, Bill Pickett was the sole archivist, but uh, that later branched after Alan Robinson, but that later branched out uh, from 1979 onwards to the extensive team of registrars we have today. So please welcome to the stage all of our registrars who are here today. I know we've got uh, Derek Graham for the TR6s, Phil Horsley, the Grinnell Registrar. We've got Roger Ferris, TR5s, Mike Ellis, TR2, 33A, and John Marshall, TR4, 4A, Bill Piggott. So please welcome onto the stage all of our registrars. Oh, we have our Italia Registrar as well, Graham. We'll have to squeeze you on here. Uh, we've got uh, Nigel Cluley as well for the Peerlesses and Warwicks. And uh, Nigel can do our risk assessment on whether we can fit all these people onto the stage. No, no uh, good. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are the guys who look after the records in the club. These are our model experts, the TR registrars. And I shall start with, well, the first one that we have in attendance here today, Bill Pickett. Uh, Bill, take the uh, wireless mic there and tell us how the registrar network that we see in front of us here came to be. Well, uh, at risk of repeating some of what I said last night, I will reiterate. I'm not the first registrar. Uh, that was Alan Robinson, who sadly passed away last year. And Alan was both registrar and Honsec of the club right from the very early days. Not from the very start, I don't think, but within a year. Because the club was called the TR Register, the register was meant to be a list of surviving TRs. Um, and Alan was the man who started compiling that, I think, probably 1971. Yeah. Um, and he did it by receiving from Val the membership numbers, membership forms rather, that had come in. And um, once Val had processed them and made people members of the club, she passed on the hard copy um, membership forms to Alan as registrar. And he basically took the details of the cars from those forms. And to a large extent, that still goes on today, doesn't it, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hasn't really changed. It's still a manual system, basic manual system. So Alan, Alan Robinson did that in conjunction with his uh, work as on sec of the club, probably for seven years. And I think he finally decided to drop the registrarship in, uh, and passed it on to me in 1978. Uh, as, as Wayne said a minute ago, of course, in the early 70s, there was only two threes and three A's as officially members. The others were associates, and I don't think we even kept details of the fours and four A's in those days. Um, so I was passed on in 1978 from Alan about four large lever arch files with probably even then 3,000 membership forms, I would say, because um, we, were, we were up to member... 3,000 by 1976, um, and um, I took over, again, running a wholly manual system, um, probably then ran it from 1978 uh, till 19... We were talking about this, weren't we? 2003. 2000, well, 2003, I was the TR233A registrar. Because when I took over, I was still registrar, as Alan had been, of every mark. Uh, because by then, fours and four A's were full members, although fives and sixes and sevens weren't at that stage. And um, we decided, I think about 1980, 
to split. This was too much work for one person. All these new later cars were coming in. We decided at that point we, we needed a TR44A registrar, a 233A registrar, which remained me, a 44A registrar, and um, uh, a 5 and 6 registrar. TR7s were still not full members of the club. Um, <laughs> can, any, can any of us remember when TR7s were finally allowed as full members? Early 80s? Yes. As a guess? Yes. <laughs> 84, someone says? Yes. Yeah. It, it, it certainly wasn't, there's, wasn't in there. There's certainly a letter from 1979 yeah. from the uh, uh, Triumph Factory uh, saying that they, they would love to support the TR register and offer full factory support, especially in times of uncertainty, I think the letter says. Uh, this is in your book, Bill, that you wrote 10 yeah. years ago on the 40th anniversary. It's worth a read. But the stipulation was that if the factory are going to support the TR register car club, you must support and accept owners of the TR7 models. Yeah, what the, what the Standard Triumph, um, well, British Leyland, as it then was, wanted the committee to do, and I can remember being at the committee meeting in Roger Clark's flat in Ealing, um, where we discussed this in detail, the proposal from British Leyland was that they would put a membership entry form in every handbook going out with every new TR7 worldwide. Um, and, you know, the, the corollary to that was we'd get a lot of business. In fact, it would have been enough more, more business than we could have possibly handled then. I'm sure Val would agree. But um, the corollary was that we had to accept them. And we debated this and we decided it would change the nature of the club far too dramatically. And we turned it down. So that, that's what you're referring yep, to yep. there. Three and that years would later, be about 79, yes. Yeah, three, three or four years later, of course, they were finally accepted, and there is a note on each one of those letters from, from Darrell saying, this must be discussed at every board meeting. And yeah. thankfully, <laughs> finally... They caved in and, and let us in, Phil. They let us in. Yeah, We're but of allowed course, in. what you've got to remember is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By 1984, of course, um, British Leyland were no longer interested in the TR7. They'd stopped making them in '81, so it wasn't in their interests to. Well, they didn't care. Basically, is what it amounted to. It was a great year, 1984. It was the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw that in. <laughs> well, anyway, so, so we, we we did we did then split. We did split it into, uh, I think it was only three registrar ships originally. Yeah, the fives and six were together. It wasn't long after that that the five became a separate register. The first four for a registrar was, was it Bob Rowland? No, it wasn't Bob. First, first four for a registrar? Well, it was Pete Bowden or somebody before Pete. Bob Rowland took over from me. The other way around, yeah. right. Yeah, well, Pete, Bowden Pete Bowden's right. here today. I have to see, there he is. Yeah, he's up the back there. The wave Pete, yeah. TR4 registrar of old. Uh, the first, when we split the TR5 registrar ship off, was that yourself? Or were you still doing fours and four A's? No, it was split off, I think. Yeah. Um, Clive, Robert, Clive Roberts. Do you oh, anyone remember Clive Roberts? Did Clive do the four A before? I'm not sure. He certainly was the first five registrar. Yeah. There was, a, there was somebody called Reynolds, but I wouldn't like to say what his first name was. Anyway, well, we're uh, rambling now, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> so, so j j just like you, you, held the, you took the uh, TR233A registrar and you handed it to Mike Ellis, so yeah. now hand the microphone to right. Mike and let's talk about the side screen cars in the TR register now, what the numbers are like. I think there was a statistic at one point that every TR2 still on the road we had in the club. Is that still the case? No, there's quite a lot we haven't got. Right. There's a lot we don't know about. Uh, according to the DV8, there's about 1,500 on the roads. And considering that the side screen TR was a rare car, even in the 50s, yeah. they only sold 6,000 in this country in 10 years. So they weren't a common sight. And to have 1,500 on the road, which obviously includes a lot of imports, is, uh, is quite a good total. Yeah, and the, uh, the TR3A, of course, the biggest selling of the side screen cars, fifth, just over 58,000 of them made, and less Un than 20,000. Under 2,000 two, two in this country. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, a uh, good, strong uh, pool of data that you have on those side screen cars now. Have you seen a change in ownership over the last few years? What has the, been uh, the main changes since you took over the registrar ship, do you think? Well, obviously, there's, there's less uh, people tinkering their own cars these days. A lot of people are buying them, you know, sort of investments and that sort of thing. 
But and do you think cars are changing hands less frequently now than oh, they were? Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, because in, back, back in, the, uh, in the 70s, they were changing hands more than once a year quite often. Mm -hmm. I mean, my brother bought a TR2 in 1969. It had three owners in the previous 18 months. And that, that wasn't uncommon as they were sort of gradually rotting away. And, but from the 70s and 80s, they were being rebuilt more and people tend to hang on to them longer. Well, fantastic job that you continue to do, Mike, and I uh, hope you continue to do it for much longer yet. As uh, We talk to Derek Graham now about TR6s because we mentioned the American market for the side screen cars. You have a, an also a big job to track all of those cars that get imported from the States into the UK, don't you? Yeah. Um, Bill mentioned four lever arch files. I've got 40 <laughs> lever arch files. They've all been digitized in some form or other into a database. Um, we have two and a half thousand members who own the TR6. There are something in the order of, I can't remember the figure, something like 4,000 on how many left, and 1,200 on uh, Son. Mm. So still a few out there that we haven't, mm. uh, we don't have. But by far the most numerous car in the club, TR6s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have de on the database, we've got details of 27,000 different TR6s wow. out of the... 91,850 built. That's not bad. 27%. That's not bad going, yeah. That's not bad <laughs> a long going. way to go. <laughs> but that's worldwide. And still, cars turn up turn out up, of nowhere, don't turn they? Turn up all the time. Yep. New, new UK cars all the time. Brilliant. It's amazing. Brilliant. Absolutely. Well, Roger, you, of course, look after TR5s, TR250s, and tracking the American cars in that sector is rather more easy because they're basically two different models. So tell us about the TR5s. Uh, you occasionally hear the quip that there are more TR5s on the road now than were ever built. <laughs> <laughs> How true is that? Come on, dispel the myths. <laughs> well, it's not true, but it does sometimes seem, seem like it. And after 50-odd years, new ones still appear, or new to us, and you think, well, that's quite incredible. I mean, I've learnt of two new ones in the past two weeks. Not in this country, but, but still around. Genuine cars. Amazing. And, and they do come up. The main difference, I suppose, for us now is that TR250s are very popular over here, but they're actually popular throughout the world. You know, there's loads in Holland, loads... Obviously, mainland Europe is good for them. They're left-hand drive, they were built left-hand drive, they stay left-hand drive, they're ideal cars. So they spread around, and it's far more difficult, actually, now keeping track of them, because you knew they were in the US. Now they merrily cross sure. country borders quite regularly. Sure, sure. And it, uh, has there been a big move towards keeping 250s standard now rather than turning them into TR5s, as you seem to see a lot of at one point? Well, personally, I don't think you can turn them into a TR5. They are mm. a 250. You can modify them as per a 5. But people generally now are enjoying more um, personalising their cars. Yeah. And there's obviously, you, you can go the extreme of fuel, if Lucas fuel injection or whatever, but other people are using electronic fuel injection. And obviously changes to seats and screens and all sorts of things, interiors, just to suit themselves. And that's part of the living breed. It's, it's what we did back in the 70s with our cars. In, their, in our own way, we modified them for ourselves. We still do. I can't talk about TR5s without mentioning the issue of values. They have gone crazy in the last five odd years especially, haven't they? What do you predict now? What do you think? Are they going to level off? or where, where are we going, Roger? Where are we going? We've got investments out here we need to sort. <laughs> I, I, I haven't stockpiled any. I don't, I've been surprised. We talk about values and I sometimes think, is that, is that truly a value? Is that truly what they're worth or that's yeah. what people are paying? Um, we were talking earlier about the change of profile of ownership. And I like to think people are buying fives because they want to use them. Or, or 250s because they want to use because they're lovely cars. They want to use them. It's nice to think it's appreciating. After all, it's a fair lump of money to get tied up in a yeah. car, unfortunately. These days, which makes, it, it makes them less accessible for a lot of people, which I think is a shame. Yeah. One of the things I think I would note nowadays is that more and more people seem to own more than one TR. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know if that's the same with the earlier cars or not. People now, seem, they seem to attract them. And a challenge so, for the club as well, the because uh, multiple ownership means effectively less members, so a challenge for that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe you should um, charge extra for <laughs> more yeah. than one car. Me a membership <laughs> per car. <laughs> don't think that'll go down well. <laughs> we, we, should all be getting, we should all be getting freedom passes and have it free of charge. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> One problem with the, um, the value of the TR5 is you do get some uh, unscrupulous people passing off 250s. 
um, you know, putting the injection on them and passing them off that. Um, you know, I, I, I've come across a few uh, cases of that. Uh, I'm sure Roger's got you know, several. Yeah. Well, I guess the message is never buy a 250 unless it's got Go Faster stripes on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's more a case of buy what you are comfortable with, but yeah. research it properly first, and if it's the right car for you and the price is right, then buy it. And this, of course, leads me into pointing out just what a great job you do for the club, because when we have new members join us, a lot of people cite the magazine as the reason they, they join the club, but many, many people really appreciate the work that all of you guys do in helping them to decide whether that car is genuine, what the history of it is, and helping new members especially learn more about TRs. And it's down to you guys and your hard work. So uh, big thanks to all of the registrars for that. Graham, uh, talking of values, your, your cars that you look after are worth the odd bob or two, aren't they, these, these Italias? <laughs> and uh, you've done a fantastic job in pulling together what is quite a rare car to find, and you've found them all over the, all over the world, haven't you, with the records? Yes, I'm very fortunate. I've uh, only been doing the job three years, I believe, but, um, yeah, uh, I have a very small band. Of my lever arch files are... <laughs> not like five or six <laughs> TR register members, but I you know, re members, owners all over the world. Uh, it's a unique group. I've got 50 owners plus with cars on the road and another 30 odd. Great help. The records were done by uh, Adrian Sinner many years ago, who's an American, uh, an Irish American, believe it or not, and a TR Register member. And a good cartoonist. And a very good cartoonist <laughs> as well. Um, they spend a lot of time, but we have very accurate records uh, of everything. And then they went to Italy back in the 80s and found records from both Rufino, who was the Italian importer and built the cars, uh, along with Vignali records and Michelotti records. So I've got a nice file and some very nice people, and I get emails from all over the world. Yeah, and of all course, the time. raising the profile of the Italia, you know, years ago, no one would have known what an Italia was. They were not really known in the UK at all, but through the TR register and the fantastic display that um, we had at the NEC a, a couple of years ago, um, you know, you and the previous registrars, Paul Harvey, who came before you, really boosted the, the, uh, the knowledge of Italia. So uh, fantastic for such a rare and exotic car. Brilliant. Yes, yeah, so, because we also got invited to Monterey Week to put on of a, course, yeah. this this year. Yeah. So we had Concorso Italiano with uh, six Italias. Um, so that was another boost, and um, you know, worldwide. Yeah. Uh, many more emails. Can I buy an Italia? Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> if you're lucky. They should all be giving you a commission, Graham, because all their values have gone up now because of your hard work. <laughs> John Marshall with your fantastic Michelotti uh, jumper on. Good to see yeah. you. And, of course, uh, you look after the TR4s, the 4As, and we must mention the Doves. Oh, we must Very mention, important the doves. To mention the Doves. Yeah. And uh, that's been a particular project of yours, finding that TR4 derivative and raising the profile of that car and find out more of the information, because we didn't know a lot about them early on, did yeah. we? Yeah, I made the mistake of uh, writing about them and making them popular before buying one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a, you know, quite a com more complex car to trace, I would think, the TR4s than many people might realise, because there were so many different variations, difficult to find records. There was a fire at the factory that destroyed a lot as well, wasn't there? You've had your work cut out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> many yeah. hours at Gaydon, I know, yeah. going through yeah. archives. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, that's more and more difficult now. Uh, we used to have access to the film, but the film gets brittle, and they've digitised it, and you can't read the damn thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's difficult. Well, but, uh, fantastic yeah. work, John, as yeah. ever. You keep going, and we mm -hmm. appreciate all you do yeah. for the TR4s. The, uh, I, I find the, the, the research is a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. I was saying this earlier. Um, you know, that Suddenly you find that one piece in the jigsaw puzzle and things move forward. It's the same thing uh, you know, with um, the, the records, mm. I find. And, you know, we, we all ask questions of our registrars and we get an instant reply back and it's all very <laughs> quick and hopefully and we understand, all, you know, but 
<laughs> the amount of work that's gone into finding the answer to that question at some point in the history yeah. of, of you building those records is incredible. Yeah. So uh, we all one appreciate of the, it. Uh, one of the best bits about it is when somebody comes to you and says, the DVLA won't let me uh, license the car. Yeah. Uh, and then you put together a case to it and um, DVLA accept it. And you, know, you get the letter back for, you know, saying, thanks ever so much. You know, uh, without the work done, I wouldn't have done it. Brilliant. Particularly when they've put a lot of time and a lot of money into it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, uh, of course, you found derivatives amongst the TR7 fraternity, Phil, because uh, Phil is our caretaker of the TR7 records at the moment. Uh, big cheer for TR7s. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed in now. We're allowed in, yeah. <laughs> well, what you have to remember is uh, 114,000 units, the most successful TR ever built. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Most numerous and TR what sold. What I would say is Dr. Christopher Smith yes. has got every build record. He has, and almost every, every TR7 build. And, built, and I, think I think he's bought every TR7, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, <laughs> so uh, Christopher uh, helps uh, Phil with the TR7 records. He writes a lot of uh, the archive stuff for the TR7s. At last count, he had 108 TR7s in his That's collection, true, yes. didn't he? Uh, yeah. And has every build record. He's just got record. a TR7 Pro, which is quite a rare car, yep. Australian uh, uh, car. And uh, I think there's only two, yeah? And I think he's got both now. So, And he's just bought the... Um, third purdy car from the avengers yeah so, Amazing. He's got, so he's got all those as well yeah fantastic and of you, course you work on the grinnells as well phil and that's been an important mm. thing of raising the profile of the grinnells and indeed the dell yeah. lines cars but those grinnells in particular that had been seen around the tr register for years of course lorraine peterson yes. had uh, the famous yeah. mil round yeah, star one's car still around as well yeah, Adrian still Brown owns that, yes. um, yeah. but I certainly didn't know much about Grinnells until you started pulling Chasing together the records road. and <laughs> Steve Redway's tapes, but we've raised the profile of them. Yes. Yeah, and I think uh, I was a bit lucky, and John, I managed to buy one and then raise the profile, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I own three now, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to own more, but uh, my good lady has sort of put a bit of a break on that. But uh, yeah. you were talking about uh, getting the support from the actual manufacturer, though. It's the only manufacturer left if you really want to say yeah. something. Yeah. Yes. So, so he is supportive when you catch him on the right moment. But, yes. uh, so, uh, uh, but he's very much Grinnell still have, are around with the Scorpion, the, the Scorpion 3, Scorpion 4. Uh, just moved into a new workshop. And he tells me he's got three bodies, and he tells mm. me he's going to build three more, mm. but he just doesn't know what engine to put in it now because mm. it's such a choice. This always was a Rover V8. So. Right, give him his credit. He mm. kept TR's current and desirable well into the 1990s, yes. long past when the factory had start, stopped yeah. making them. And, and for that, we must give him a bit of credit, I think. Uh, absolutely, yeah, you know, because, uh, you know, I didn't know what a Grinnell was when I first bought my TR7 and bought mine in Gloucester. And, Drove it once, and that was I was smitten, you know. And uh, I remember I let my friend Jeff Mason Wen drive one, and within weeks he'd bought one, you know. <laughs> so it was, uh, it just goes on and on and on. And certainly, without doubt, the V8 was the right thing for the TR7 yeah. and yeah. the TR8. But uh, um, yeah, a great uh, car, and thanks all support from Steve as well, bringing that through with the red, with the Redway tapes on that. But that was uh, great information, and uh, I've built on those records ever since. So. Mm. And great that we have a, a, a wedge register now that yeah. looks after all these different aspects of the TR7 range, yeah. and they were the most numerous, so there's a huge amount of records there, but also that uh, you get to share all of your knowledge and share the burden of the hard work as well and, and promote yeah. the mark. Yeah, it was very sad to lose Jim earlier this year, Jim Picard. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm caretaking the records. But uh, as a wedge team, we, we try to keep everything together because there are so many variants uh, that are around now. And uh, I'm just about to get all the build records for the Dow lines, which I've been searching for for ages. And uh, finally, I've got them. So I haven't quite well got done. them, but they're coming. So that will be the next step. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, on to another derivative then. Let's talk about uh, Peerlesses and Warwicks. Uh, Nigel, you've... Uh, Looked after the Peerlesses for a few years now. Uh, John Four, Dolan 14. before you, I think it was. Yeah, 14 years now. And yeah, new you've, boy. You've raised the profile of those also, I think. Yeah, yeah, we've done well, and, and getting out there and racing. That's yeah. that's been really, really good. Yeah. And plenty to write about. And Celia and Ian, Celia's uh, wonderful reports of racing, seat of the pants racing, um, which has caught a lot of people's imagination. And those cars, you know, we are still cheap entry cars. Mm. 
Mm. And fantastic that you have a genuine Le Mans car within your group as well. Of yes, a car still, that, yeah. that raced in the 50s at Le Mans. And he, and he uses it for the supermarket, just like it's not. Yeah, he's, he's actually <laughs> relented. He's, he's actually got a Euro box now for <gasps> about the last wow. 10 years. But yeah, right up until 2000 ish, um, 2008, I think, uh, you'd see it in Sainsbury's car park on a Saturday morning doing Amazing. the shopping. Uh, with a big Monza cap sticking out the back window <laughs> <laughs> and the stripes on and the lamps, yeah. So it's Climbing a special car, that, yeah. yeah. What do you think the challenges are um, for a registrar of derivatives over the, what I'd call the production cars? Is it a tougher job, do you think? It, it is in that we've got very little factory build records or anything like that. Um, so really, it's when people get in touch with us, they bought a car and then they're all over you like a rash. Mm. Um, and so that's a struggle. And when people want to know if it widget suffix B was fitted, well, it was just what they could get. And they were probably on stop with Wilmot Breeden for door handles. So they go to somebody else for door handles for a month. Yeah. And then they, they pay their bill. So there's a lot of that as well. So nothing's really nailed down. And so many variations on the same car as well that weren't really made records, especially with the Grinnells. I mean, there were 350 made and 350 different cars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it must be kind of a little bit the same with yours. Yeah, the, the, the Phase 1 and the Phase 2 were very, very similar, really, but they, that was more build design yeah. that they realised this wonderful new product, fiberglass, that now you could work with it. And that it was in its infancy, you know, you've got to think 1955-56 for, for fiberglass was really early, and the peerless prototype was, uh, the first one was Ali. Well, the first two were aluminium. Um, but yeah, by 57, they were going into fiberglass. Mm. A lot cheaper product. Absolutely. Well, fantastic to have such a great group of registrars with us here that do amazing work to make sure that not only the archives and the records of the cars we love are protected, but that new members coming into the club have the information they need to buy the right car, and that also the TR register remains a register of TRs. Big round of applause then to the TR registrars. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.